الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. Behind enemy lines. A very intriguing topic. In 1991, Iraq invaded Kuwait and Saudi Arabia fearing the invasion of its own kingdom invited half a million American troops into the country. They concentrated in the eastern province, Khobar, Dammam. And as they prepared to decimate the Iraqi military, a soldier from the Saudi uh, military, a sergeant, began to develop a close relationship with some of the Americans. He didn't know very much English, but he was just a friendly kind of a guy. So he mixed with them, uh, he took them into town to get things that they needed, etc. He even slept in the tents with them. His intention was Dawa. When he was able to befriend a sufficient amount of them, it was now time to actually present something to them. Because they were asking him about Islam, but he couldn't explain very much to them because his English was just too weak. So he sought me out. I was in Riyadh at the time and uh, brought me to the American camps. And they arranged some open sessions for the troops who wanted to ask questions about Islam. Before addressing their questions, I gave them a brief idea about what Islam is. Basic teachings, not real da'wah in the sense of comparative, getting into Bible and these kinds of things, just presenting what is Islam. But keeping in mind that they were Westerners and the way that Westerners think, I presented it according to that. In the course of these presentations, a couple of them accepted Islam, alhamdulillah. But we didn't have very much time because the war then began shortly after my first visits. 
After the war was over, and it was quite short, the troops had to be processed out of Saudi Arabia and back to the US. We now had half a million troops and it was going to take time to get them out. So they moved them from a tented area that they were in before into some uh, towered areas that had been built many years before, a region they called them Hobart Towers. This, these buildings had been built, huge high-rise, uh, 20 stories, 25-story building, but enough to make up what would have been a community, quite a large area. And these had been built originally for Bedouins. The idea was to bring them in off the desert and settle them. And after the government built them up and everything, the Bedouins came in and looked around, checked them out, said, no, no, we don't want this. We prefer to live out in the desert the way we're living. And they built these outside of Jiddah and other parts. And they were unanimous in not living there. So they remained empty for years, just sitting there. So the American troops were put in there. They occupied that area. And there was a huge um, open area. The buildings were all around. There's an open area there. And in that open area, between the buildings, uh, various businesses, you know, Saudi entrepreneurs, wanting to sell gold jewelry, t-shirts, everything. They came, they set up tents here, there, and everywhere, right? And um, we requested that we get a tent also for just presenting the message. The tent was called, it was quite large, you know, it was almost the length of this uh, masjid here. It was called, had a big label on the side, it was called the Saudi Arabian Cultural Information Tent. Right? We are going to explain Saudi culture. And uh, the American military authorities, they were very happy to facilitate it for us because it couldn't happen without their permission. Uh, because the people were there and it was going to take time for them to be processed out of the country. So anything that could be done to keep them occupied, they were in favor of, they were supportive of. Because usually when uh, American troops go into a country, whether it's the Philippines, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, Thailand, they go into these places, they turn the country or the, the neighboring areas into brothels. You know? They have money. The women of that area would then prostitute themselves. This would be an R&R &R situation for the American troops. That was the norm. And of course, it wasn't happening in Saudi Arabia. It just wasn't happening. There are no women available. You know, you know. So they had to do some things to keep these guys occupied. So we set up the tent. Alhamdulillah, we got a team together of other American brothers and we began the process of giving da'wah to them behind enemy lines. How did we set up the tent? When you first came in the tent, from this side, say for example, to the main entrance, 
they'd come in. We had a series of tables with books about Saudi Arabian culture, about the desert, about the animals, about the dress of the people, and all these types of books. In the middle of the books, there would be some what is Islam pamphlets and booklets there. And after that, we had another table where we had uh, Qurans in English. Because we noted that many of them had wanted to get copies of the Quran. They wanted to take it back as a souvenir. You know, when you're going to different countries, as tourists, you want to take back a souvenir from the country. Something when you come back, your friends ask, okay, so what did you bring back? They can say, right, this, uh, I got this uh, book. It's their holy book. I brought it back. Some people actually objected. They said, no, we can't give these people the Quran. Of course, it's, English, it's translated. They were translated versions. Some of them had Arabic texts also. And, um, of course, the scholars had already identified what constitutes Quran and what doesn't constitute Quran. The basic definition that they made was where the words of Allah are less than the words of man, it is no longer considered Quran. Because the term Quran can reverse, refer to a verse, a group of verses, a surah, or the whole Quran. So this is what they said was the distinguishing point. What distinguished between tafsir and Quran? Because the issues of wudu, being in a state of wudu with Quran, giving it to non-Muslims, this was a critical point to understand. So, many of them came and they bought copies of the Quran. We sold it to them. Not for profit, it wasn't a business, it was just making it available, cover the costs. Maybe anywhere from around 80,000 copies were sold. 60, 70, 80,000 in that region were sold. They took it back home with them. And we know, we expected, the majority of them would never read it. They would just put it in the shelf, you know, as a curiosity piece, which they could point to when their friends asked them, so what did you bring back from Saudi Arabia? And we were okay with that, because there have been a number of cases of people who became Muslims simply by coming across a Quran at a time when their curiosity was open and they took that advantage. So we figured, okay, he puts it in his house. Maybe his wife will read it. Maybe his kid will read it. Maybe his father when he comes over to visit. Or maybe a generation later, somebody will pick it up and open it. We said at least we got it into the home. Then we had some stands where they would come and sit. You know. And we had a brother from New York who called himself the Latin from Manhattan. Right? He was a former radio announcer. So he knew how to warm up listeners, right? So that's what he would do. Because they would all come in, you know, these are all military people. They're coming in, groups of them. They're curious, but at the same time, they're a little suspicious, you know, a little uneasy. Maybe an Iraqi might come running in with a bomb and blow himself up, you know, or something. So, 
he would then begin to warm them up. He would chat with them, play with them, joke with them till they felt comfortable. Okay, there. Okay, this is all right. We can relate to him. You know. Then uh, I would come in, and there was sort of like a mat and a uh, Saudi majlis on the ground there, and I would sit there, and I would give the same basic introduction to Islam what Islam is basic teachings brief then we would just throw the floor open to questions they could ask anything they wanted to ask no limitations you don't have to be on the topic anything that comes to your head and Americans are very curious. You know, we tried to do this with the British, but they didn't even allow us into the British areas. British officers, no. Not interested. Americans, they're more open, curious. Yeah. So, alhamdulillah, it's good. Actually, one of the things we did, we made a skit. It was called, and we recorded it, it's a cassette. It's called Saudi Culture. And in it, a American was brought into a Saudi's home. This is the scene of this skit. So he comes into the home and, you know, he chats with the host. And um, there are a couple of us that are there in, in, engaged in the conversation with him. And it was done in a light, funny style. The American was played by a brother by the name of Hudayfa, from Philadelphia. Uh, he, till today, has a program on Saudi TV, a youth program, which he uh, does with uh, Saudi youth. You know, alhamdulillah. He's a funny guy. So he played the part of the curious American, you know, voicing their curiosity. And we had a Saudi brother whose English was pretty good. He would be responding and we would also back up and add other points. This was distributed amongst them to listen. This was also a means of acquainting them to Islam through the culture. Anyway, in the tent, as I said, we opened up for any questions they wanted. And they asked about everything. Of course, many of them were shocked when they came to Saudi Arabia because they were coming thinking they were going to be in the middle of the desert, they would be seeing camels going by left and right, you know, you had camel crossings and, and they came, they saw all these cars and the city built up and Burger King and McDonald's and they said, what? <laughs> what is this? You know, they were quite shocked. So they had a lot of curious questions to ask. And of course, sometimes we have to go back and do research to find out how to answer these questions. Among the questions that they asked was, uh, why some uh, people wore red and white scarves? You know, the... Ghutra, others wore black and white, All others only wore white. What, what, what does this mean? You know? so. so we gave them the background, the different areas of the Arab world. They, these are just styles, but no real significance. Then they asked about the iqal that is worn on the scarves. When they first asked, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Uh, I went and I asked Saudi friends, where did this thing come from? All of the Saudi, they didn't have any answers. Nobody knew. We all, we just wear it, you know. <laughs> we don't know where it came from. So eventually I got to talk with some of the elders. And they were able to explain that, oh, this originally was 
the hobbling cord of the camel. I talked about it in Juma today. So they explain where it came from. And then, after you hobbled your camel, you need to get back on and ride. You had this hoop of rope. What to do with it? Twist it, put it on your head. Keeps your scarf in place as you're riding, you know, so it doesn't fly off your head. It's multi-purpose, right? So, alhamdulillah, they like that. Uh, they asked many questions. Sometimes they asked about uh, what they, they called uh, the BMOs. Uh, you all know about UFOs, right? UFO, unidentified flying objects. Well, they had developed this phrase they call BMOs, right? What are the BMOs? Black moving objects. <laughs> this was in reference to Saudi women who were wearing full abayas and they would just be moving. They would see them, oh boy, what was that? You know? <laughs> so, they're curious you know, about these black moving objects. So we gave them the background and uh, we took them into Saudi homes. You know, the women, especially the women would, would sit with them and get to know who was behind these uh, veils, right? And of course they were shocked because we put them in the homes of Saudis who had uh, studied in the West so the women could speak good English, they were educated, you know, and they were living lives like queens. The women were just aghast. Wow, I wish I was like you, you know. You know, they were really impressed at how much the woman was honored and she had this position in the home and people looking after her, you know. Somebody to drive her wherever she needs to go. Then, we took groups of men into the masjids. At first, when we took the first group, we wanted to bring them into the masjid. They said, oh no. We can't go in there. I said, why? I said, because the officers told us that we should not come within 30 meters of any mosque. Means you go walking around, don't go near these places, right? So that's what they told us. They said, no, it's okay. Oh, we got, we got orders, though. we can't do this. So we had to talk back with the officers, clarify it, and get the okay. Give them the okay, they can go in. So we started taking groups of them into the masjid. And of course, when we first took them into the masjid, you know, we tried to take them at times when, uh, in the morning when people weren't praying there. But of course, occasionally, some Saudis would come in and say, oh, what are these guys doing here? Kufar, Najis, get them out of the masjid. We had to, hold on, hold on, it's okay. Of course, we had to inform the Imam, you know, listen, if these things happen, you got to control your people here, you know. Let them know that it is actually halal. It's not haram. In fact, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did it. He met uh, delegations in the masjid. Delegations of kuffar. They came in the masjid. He met with them. He even tied up one of the prisoners from the battle of, uh, I think it was Uhud, tied him up in the masjid for three days and nights. So it was, but most people never heard about this. They don't know it. All we know is, innamal mushrikuna najis. You know, this is it. So, we had to clarify this point. Anyway, they would come in, <coughs> take off their boots outside and come in, sit down and we clarify for them, well, yes, you see, this is the mosque. We don't have an altar on which we slaughter Christians in spite of what you've been told, right? We don't do human sacrifices in here, no. It's just a place of prayer. Right. Very simple. They were impressed. Because the masjids, Saudi Arabia in general, they're very plain. 
very plain. And actually, though we tend to look at the fancy masjids with all the colors and carvings and calligraphy and all these different things as being something really beautiful, the Prophet ﷺ had said that one of the signs of the last days would be the beautification of the masjids. You know, because that's not the purpose of the masjid. The masjid is for prayer, for remembering Allah. And Prophet ﷺ, when he used to wear garments which had lines or whatever on it, and it caught his attention, he, after the prayer, he gave away the garment. He didn't want things that would distract him from prayer. So even the rugs, right, with all these designs and things on it, this is actually counterproductive. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You stand there praying, you look and you see these lines and then they start to move and you, you think you see things crawling there and you know. Really, the rug should be plain. That is closer to the sunnah. Anyway, point is, they came in, we explained to them about the different elements of the mosque, the mihrab, its purpose, the mimbar, the minaret. We explained the different uh, parts of the mosque. And they would ask questions. So, how do you pray? We show them. What do you say in your prayer? We told them. And they would stay until Dhuhr time and they would observe Salat al Dhuhr, sitting at the back. They observe Salat al Dhuhr. And you know, so many of them afterwards would come up to me and the other brothers and say, You know, we have seen real prayer. You guys are really praying. What we're doing back home in the church, it's not prayer. If you've ever seen the churches in America, they have basically a disco atmosphere. The minister is like the lead singer, right? He has a choir, which is, you know, his backup singers. And they got musical instruments, their guitar, piano, drums, the whole shot, you know? And everybody's swaying and, you know, it's, it's... And they call it prayer. But these guys, after seeing that, seeing the calmness of the prayer, the quiet of the masjid, yeah, it left them big impression on them really we also in the course of explaining answering questions we had questions that would come up about Christianity because of course some of them were more practicing Christ Christians you know and they'd heard stories about Muslims and their beliefs and they would feel that yes, we need to take the message of Christianity to these people So some of them would try to evangelize right. But whenever those kind of discussions would arise I used to cut them short If it was simple enough, I could give a few words answer response uh, I would do it if it, I could see they want to get in deep, then we'd, I would stop it and say, listen, we had connected to our tent another tent, a smaller tent. I said, for those who want to get into deep, you know, religious discussion, then we have that other tent over there. So they would get up and they would go into that tent. I said, because, you know, I, and everybody was happy with that because most people really didn't want to get into deep religious discussions. They just were curious about 
what's going on in this country. What, what are the people like? Why do they all drive, you know, Nissan pickup trucks? Why? Why is it so common? Everybody seems to have a Nissan pickup truck. This was the favorite of the Bedouins, right? They like Nissan pickup trucks. So, in that tent, we had a brother from Sri Lanka. A big, tall brother with a huge beard. He had an interesting story. He was studying to be a minister, a Christian minister. And when he had finished a certain level of his studies, he was going to work in the field, to do some field work. And he chose what was supposed to be the most difficult field to do uh, evangelical work. He heard that the Arabs are the most difficult people to convert. Most difficult. They had been trying for years. They never managed to convert a single Saudi. So he is a bold kind of guy. He said, that's where I want to go. Right. So he went in as a, an accountant. He had training in accountancy. So he went in as an accountant. But of course, his main goal was da'wah. So when he got there, you know, he's getting accustomed, acclimated to the situation. He uh, decided he was better buy himself a Quran, you know, because he's got a big job ahead of him. He needs to know this book backwards and forwards. I mean, he'd studied it when he was doing the ministry studies. He had studied portions that had been presented to him by the, his teachers, his professors. But he wanted to get the book and read it from cover to cover, he said. So, he got his Quran, and in the evening, after he finished work, he started reading. He read, and he read, and he read, till he finished the whole Quran. Not too many people read the whole Quran. I mean, from Fatiha to Nas. When he finished reading the Quran, he went looking for Muslims and said to them, I want to take Shahada. I want to be a Muslim. And they took him to one of the uh, Muslim brothers who took him to one of the offices and he took Shahada. He went up to Qasim for a while, they gave him some training, Islamic teaching, background, and then they turned him loose. And he was a Dawa dynamo. I mean, I'd never seen anybody like him. He used to come to Riyadh, and from the airport he would take a taxi and come to my house, visit me before going into the city. I lived on the outskirts of Riyadh. And invariably, whenever he came, he would bring the taxi driver in with him to take Shahada. <laughs> From the airport to my place, he'd given him enough dawah, he's ready to take Shahada. Regularly. You know, he was, as I said, he was a dawah dynamo. And uh, he used to tell me, you know, he said, if the night came and I hadn't given the shahada, I felt uneasy. What, what did I do wrong? What did I miss out on today? This was Muhammad Sharif from Sri Lanka. So, when we put the team together out there in Dammam, 
khubar. We brought him along. And he was the one waiting in the tent. Right? And he used to have this big suitcase with him, right? So when the people would come in and they would sit down with him, and they say, yeah, yeah, we want to talk about the gospel. You know, the Bible. So he said, okay, fine. Which Bible? He said, what? Which Bible you want to talk about? He said, the Bible. It's just one Bible. He said, no, there isn't. He would open up his suitcase and whip out for them about 15 different Bibles. They'd be, whoa. <laughs> we didn't know about that. And then from there he would wipe them out. Those that didn't succumb to his dawah, they would say, we better go back and talk to our chaplain. Chaplain was the, um, the religious uh, representative from the different uh, religious groups as part of military, American military policy that they have religious uh, you could call them religious guides or representatives. So each sect would have the representative, the major sect. Actually, they even had a representative for Satan worshippers. Yeah. yeah. There are recognized and accepted sects of worshippers in America. Satan, Satan worship. They have their own Bible called Satan's Bible. And uh, they had their representative there. Anyway, the point is that a number of them would go back and they would bring their chaplains to do battle with Muhammad Sharif. Alhamdulillah, in the course of our six months there, 11 chaplains gave shahada. Alhamdulillah. 11 chaplains took shahada. The numbers of people from our dawah in the main tent started to grow the numbers of people who were accepting Islam. Two, three, five, ten. Till we were hitting numbers like 20 a day. This continued half months. We ended up with over 3,000 people accepting Islam from the Saudi Arabian cultural information tent. <laughs> of course, the tent became known very quickly as the conversion tent. <laughs> and the chaplains wanted to shut it down, you know, because the word spread. They wanted to stop it. But the officers, the senior officers, they said, no, you know, people are free if they want to go their business the only thing they could do is that sometimes when they're walking by they would have these you know uh, dawa books their dawa books and they would just walk by the entrance and throw it inside keep walking right so sometimes in the course of lectures we just see a book come flying in you know? <laughs> that's all they could do right Alhamdulillah, some of them accepted Islam because when they were out on maneuvers, they would come across Bedouins out in the desert. You know, nobody for miles. They would come across this Bedouin there with his tent. He's got sheep, goats, whatever. And he would see them, and they're all geared down, you know, they got their big packs and, you know, their weapons, and they're marching in there. And they would see him, and he would say, check, check that side, check that side, maybe it's a trap, whatever. He said, oh no, it's just him by himself. They would come over, sit down. Then he would take out some tea, offer them dates, heat up the tea, give them some tea, drink. He doesn't know a word of English. 
Not like the brother, at least he knew a few words. These guys would know nothing. Right? But just their, how they carried themselves, their hospitality was just enough. You know? Many of them told me afterwards, they said, you know, we have been stationed around the world. And we have never experienced hospitality like this. Never. So friendly and, you know, it was just mind-blowing, mind-boggling for them. Usually when they deal with uh, societies that they land in, people are trying to make money off them, rip them off and whatever, they're haggling this, it's just, you know, nobody's inviting them into their homes type situation. So it had a big impact on them too. So Alhamdulillah, that group went back to America and of course the troops, those who accepted Islam, they kept the da'wah going inside of the military itself. So their numbers multiplied and multiplied. When they went back to the States, they started an organization there called the MMM, Muslim Members of the Military. And eventually they requested Muslim chaplains. Their numbers were big enough that they had to be recognized. So you had Muslim chaplains who were appointed for the army, for the navy, for the air force, you know. Big changes took place. Alhamdulillah, a couple of years later, whilst this process was going on, we know that Muslims in Bosnia were being slaughtered. The Serbs were wiping them out. And they were calling on the Muslim world to help them. Muslim world was unable to provide support for them. People sent in stuff through the Red Cross, food, medicines, etc. But to militarily support them, they couldn't. Unable. This was when some uh, Muslim brothers from different parts of the world went in and joined them, fought along with them. Well, some of those Americans who returned home and left the American military, came together, formed eight teams of specialists, went back into Bosnia, trained the Bosnians and fought alongside them till the war was over. Allahu Akbar. They originally came to America, from America to Saudi Arabia with one purpose and Allah brought them back, brought them into Islam and brought them back to the Muslim world to help Muslims defend themselves. This is the greatness of Allah. The lesson that we have to take from this is that we have to look at the various circumstances that we find ourselves in as da'wah opportunities. Of course, people were arguing, should these American troops have been here in Saudi Arabia and this and that and the scholars and the this and the all kinds of stuff develop. People were complaining, etc. Kufar, etc. It didn't change the reality. They still came and they left. So it was up to us, either we take advantage of the opportunity since the Muslim world had not taken Islam to America, Allah brought Americans, half a million of them, into the middle of the Muslim world and said, teach them. It's about looking at the glass half full or half empty, isn't it? And 
That's how we have to treat the various dour circumstances that we might find ourselves in. You know, most of you are coming from many different countries in the Muslim world. And there are dawa opportunities in each and every country. And it is the responsibility of each and every one of us to carry the message of Islam to those who haven't heard that message. It is not just a recommended practice, act, to spread the word. It is an obligation. It is on our shoulders. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had told us, Man katama ilman aljamahullah bilijamin minan nar. Whoever hides knowledge, Allah will put a bridle of fire over his head on the day of judgment. And those of you that have studied fiqh, usul fiqh, they know that whenever the consequence of an act is punishment with the hellfire, then that act must be an obligatory act. That to not fulfill it means haram, you have that punishment. It is known. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He said very clearly, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَىٰ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّاهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْكِتَابِ أُولَٰئِكَ يَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ الْلَّعِنُونَ Those to whom the clear messages of Islam have come, it has been explained to them, and they hide it from people. Such will be cursed by Allah and cursed by all who would curse. And again in Surah Al-Fiqh, if an act, the consequence of an act is the curse of Allah, because the scholars of Tafsir have explained that the curse is, ref is in reference to a pond of fire in the hellfire, a pit of fire, whale. So if Allah's curse is on a person for an act, it means that that act is haram. It is haram to hide the knowledge of Islam. Now, some people say, well, I'm not hiding it. I'm just not making dawah. Well, hiding can be active or it can be passive. Active or passive. Active, for example, an American comes and asks you about Islam. And you say, no, I'm not going to tell you anything about Islam. You're killing my brothers in Afghanistan. You don't deserve to know anything. <laughs> That's active. Passive is to know this person, to work with him, to go to school with him, to live next to him. This is your neighbor. You talk to him about everything under the sun, everything you talk about, except Islam. You talk about kids, you talk about wives, you talk about vacation, you talk about car, house, the job, your boss, shopping, the best deals, sales. You talk about everything except Islam. You have passively hidden 
Islam from them. By default, you are a hider of Islam. What do you think on the Day of Judgment when we are raised up and that neighbor, that classmate, friend is asked by Allah why he didn't accept Islam, why he didn't fight. He is going to point the finger at you and he's going to say, Oh Allah! He had the knowledge and he talked to me about everything under the sun except Islam. Please give him ten times the punishment. He will curse you. He is your friend smiling in your face today. On the day of resurrection, he will curse you. You will be cursed. So we have an obligation. An obligation to carry the message of Islam to those around us. Of course, some people say, well, you need to be knowledgeable. You don't have something, what can you give? But Prophet Muhammad had said, Convey whatever you have learned from me even if it's only a single verse of the Qur'an. One verse. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ We all know. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ One verse. That verse is the answer to all of the false religions on the earth. It addresses the essence of their deviation and their misguidance. That single verse. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ Translate this verse. What does قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ mean? Huh? There's no God except Allah? That's لا إله الله, man. Come on. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ Say. We know قُلْ means say. Huh? Allahu Ahad. Huh? Huh? There's only one God. He is one. This is a mistake that some people think. Kullu Allahu Ahad means one. Allah is one. It's the same as saying Kullu Allahu Wahid. But it's not. Kullu Allahu Ahad is different from Kullu Allahu Wahid. Qul Allah Wahid is one, yes. Allah is one. And Al Wahid is among Allah's names. But Al Ahad has a different meaning. The scholars explain, language and tafsir, that Ahad, when you speak about Ahadiyya, you're talking about the uniqueness of Allah's oneness. It's more than the just one. It is a unique one. So, for example, if somebody says, I have one mobile. That's Wahid. You can have one mobile too. Everybody in the room can have one mobile. But when we use the term Ahad, it means one like whom there is no other. One who is truly unique. Nothing like him. And that's why the whole rest of the surah is explaining how unique Allah is. Allah is Samad. He has no need. Everything depends on him. Blam Yalid. He doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't give birth. Blam Yalid. Walam yulad, he's not born. Walam yakullahu kufuan ahad, and there is nothing similar to him. So this verse, Qul hu Allahu ahad, it is the response to all of the deviant religions in the world today. 
The biggest one is Christianity. It strikes at the heart of Christianity. Christianity which is about Trinity. God is three in one. And when you ask the average Christian, can you explain to me how God is three in one? They say, <coughs> well, <coughs> you know, an egg, the egg, if you have a boiled egg, you have a shell, take off the shell, you have the white, remove the white, and you have the yellow of the egg. It's one egg, but it has three parts. It's known as the egg theory. We say, oh, that may be your God. Your God might be an egg God. But for us, our God is one like whom there is no other. There's nothing in this world similar to him. So some will say, <coughs> well, you know, water, water can be a liquid, it can be a solid ice, and it can be steam, gaseous, a gas. How about that one? It's known as the water theory. You say, no, 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 no. That's a water god. Your God is a water God, not ours. Our God is one like whom there is no other. So there really is no explanation for Trinity, how it could be. Some bring out another one, which is a little trickier. They say, you. A man can be a father, you can be a brother, and you can be a son. How's that one? Father, brother, and son, all in one. How's that? Okay, what happens when the father dies? Well, both the son and the brother die too. Finish. So, you have a problem here. Doesn't work. Your God is a man God. No. That's not our God. He's like a man. So, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ is the answer. There is nothing similar And that's how they've lost their way. They've made God like his creation. And what has happened to them is that instead of worshipping the God of Jesus, they worship Jesus as God. That's where they ended up. All of the Trinitarian theory and explanations and philosophy, Greek logic and reason and all of it is used to justify the worship of a man, a human being. So when you're giving dawah <coughs> to people of Christian backgrounds, then you should know that this is where you have to take them. This is the point that you have to cause them to think, to stop and to think. You can talk about all of the other things. They like to talk about hijab. They like to talk about had cutting off hands. They like to talk about polygamy. Or they like to talk about many other topics. But in the end, and of course, when they want to speak about these things, you do have to address their questions. But you have to know that you need to take them back to Allah. Was Jesus God or not? That's where we have to take them. And when you're giving <coughs> dawah to Christians, 
there is a relatively easy way to bring them to this point of understanding. If their background is normal, standard, not hardcore. <clears throat> what Muhammad Sharif used to do is he used to ask the Filipinos and Filipinos accept Islam when compared to other nationalities at a rate of about seven to one. What Muhammad Sharif used to say to them is, <clears throat> Do you think that you could become God? Do you think that you could become God? And they would say, no, 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 of course not. Why not? Why couldn't you become God? They would say, because I'm a human being. So he said, he would then ask them, Was Jesus Christ a human being? They would say, yeah, he was a human being. So he said, well then, he couldn't have been God. I said, oh, never thought about it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. He couldn't have been God. But they, there was no chance to think. Most of them are Catholics. They grow up in a very strong Christian environment. You know, things are just poured on them. There's no time to think. If you start to think and question, they're told immediately, don't ask that question. Satan has got you, boy. You know, forget it. Don't read the Bible. They will tell them. Don't read the Bible. It will send you astray. You learn it through us. So, when you bring some simple logic, it's enough. Of course, when you're dealing with somebody who has gone to university, he's gotten education on a higher level, graduate, undergraduate education, he's done philosophy 101. He's done philosophy 101. Now you have a different cup of tea. Because when you say to him, Could you be God? Of course, if he says yes, end of conversation. No point going down that road. You've got a maniac on your hands, right? Leave him, find somebody else. Right? Who's still got their heads screwed onto their bodies properly. Right? So he says, uh, yeah, I couldn't be God, no, yeah. Why not? Because I'm human, human beings can't be God. Then he says, then you ask him, was Jesus a human being? Uh-oh, he realized he got himself in a trap. If he says yes, then he's finished. Because he learned in logic, class a, if a equals b and b equals c then a must equal c so he sees what's coming down the line right so what does he do he says somewhat what do you mean somewhat was he god or was he not god he was sometimes or partially he appeared that way he, He's found all kinds of other terminologies he doesn't want to say that he was a man. So you have to deal with him in a different way. Another explanation that Muhammad Sharif used to use for 
basic people again, the average person. He would say, you know, of course you believe that there is one God. As Christian, you believe there's one God. Three in one, but yet one. One God. There was only one God. They read the verse, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Jesus said it. It's in the Old Testament. It's known. God is one. So, he would ask them, you know, when cows give birth, you have a little cow called a calf. A cow and a calf. When dogs give birth, you have a little dog called a puppy. The dog and the puppy. When cats give birth, you have a little cat. The cat and the kitten. The little cat is called a kitten. So when God gave birth, what do you have? A little God? So you got a big God and a little God? No, 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 no. But well, what he said? If God gives birth, he can only give birth to a God. Right? Some people who have their head on correctly would say, Ah, oh, I never thought about that. Yeah. That's what it means. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that there are two gods. So therefore, God could not have given birth to Jesus. Jesus is not the Son of God. Of course, some Christians will focus on the Son of God thing and they say, but you know, yes, Jesus was the Son of God. And when you mention to them, yeah, but there are many sons of God mentioned in the Bible. Adam is called the Son of God. David. The children of Adam and Eve are called the sons and daughters of God. They said, yes, but it is with a small s. Whereas when it refers to Jesus, it's written with a capital S. Son, the big S. And you say to them, well, you know, the language in which the Gospels are written is Greek. Greek. That wasn't the language of Jesus. That's a whole other story. Jesus didn't even speak Greek. But the Gospels, the oldest manuscripts are in Greek. And the Greek language, like Arabic, does not have capitals. Is there a capital ba? Do we have capital bas and capital alephs and little alephs? <laughs> Just aleph. Finish. Similarly in Greek, they don't have capitals, big and small letters. So guess what? Somebody played a trick on you. So, <clears throat> the Dawa has to be addressed to people according to their level of understanding. How you give Dawa to a college graduate is different from how you give Dawa to a taxi driver. But know that the message of Islam the message of Islam, because it is the truth, it will win over. Don't be shy. And focus on conveying the message of Islam. Some brothers, when they finally wake up that, hey, we're supposed to be giving da'wah here, the first thing they do is, they see Zakir Naik, Ahmed Didat, and they hear all these quotes from the Bible, so the first thing they do, go buy a Bible and start studying the Bible. No, 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 no. 
So they become experts on the Bible. And when the non-Muslims ask them questions about Islam, they say, Oh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> no, no. Our base, our foundation has to be Islam. We need to learn Islam properly. Have a good understanding of the fundamental teachings, the various areas of Islam. Our duty, our responsibility is to carry that message to them in the best way, with the best language. We don't address them as non-Muslims. You disbelievers, you kuffar, you pagans, yes, they are pagans, they are kuffar, they are disbelievers, but that just closes people's ears. So, better for you to say to them, my dear, use words which are endearing, making people feel comfortable. And we give them the message of Islam where there is supportive evidence from the Bible or elsewhere we can use that as support but it shouldn't be the main presentation why because those people who get off deeply into the Bible they will end up into a situation where it becomes an issue of interpretation. You say this means this, they say no, it means that. Then where do you go from there? Because for them, they don't have clear guidelines as to meanings, etc. Everybody is free to understand and to interpret things as they wish. So very difficult to pin them down, even with the texts. So, it's best to carry that message across to them. What you do is, instead, remove the confusion, the misunderstandings about Islam. One of my favorite lectures when I give to non-Muslims is called Common Misconceptions About Islam and Muslims. And people are usually interested. Yeah, yeah, we want to know about these things. And you go from talking about Allah to polygamy to terrorism and you explain it to them. Not necessarily that you have to convince them to accept your belief and your practice, but at least that they understand that it is a rational concept. It has reason and logic behind it, whether they accept it or not is another thing. Because when you speak to them, for example, about polygamy, because that's the first question they like to ask. Why are you Muslims polygamous? And this misunderstanding is so common. I remember meeting a brother in UK, in London, who had delayed accepting Islam for two years. He had decided to become a Muslim, but he delayed becoming a Muslim for two years. And I asked him, why? He said, because... I was under the impression that when a man becomes a Muslim, he must have four wives. And I was happy with the one wife, and you know, that was enough for me. It's common misunderstanding. So, you can clarify about polygamy, not necessarily saying that, yes, you should be polygamous. No, understand. Islam did not bring polygamy into the world. It is not that the world was a monogamous world and here comes Muhammad وسلم, with polygamy. You know? No, that's not how it was. The whole world is polygamous. That's how it is. Human beings in all societies, in all corners of the world throughout history, 
from as far back as we can go to the pharaohs, to the Mesopotamians, all over the world, in the jungles of the Amazon, Borneo, people are polygamous. The anthropologists, they even have a Darwinian explanation of why human beings, men, are polygamous. Yeah. You can sit with them and they will explain to you why. They say, when you look, because they always like to go back to the animal kingdom. Right? When they want to explain about why we do what we do, they go back and look at the animals and say, see, that's why they do it and that's why we do it. So, what they do is they go back and they say, well, look. Look at the Lion King. The Lion King. He has all of the female lions with him. There are other male lions and they're always prowling around and he just beats them off and he keeps... What's happening here? They said, this is an evolutionary principle to ensure survival of the fittest. How? Well, the fact that he is the Lion King, he's able to beat up every, uh, everybody else, means he is the fittest. So by controlling the females, the whole next generation are all his kids, it means they will be the strongest. That is the explanation. So they say that's the same reason, because human beings are really only talking animals anyway. Same thing happening. So anyway, the point is, after explaining that Muslims did not introduce polygamy to the world, we explain to them that in fact Islam came and organized it, put rules, regulations, rights, obligations, set these things. It didn't leave it as it was, wide open. Anybody could have as many wives as possible and no. The kids were not considered to be the children of the father, etc. No. It is the right of the woman who is the second wife to be treated the same as the first wife. Her children are his children. So it protects the rights of the children. They will inherit as he as the other children of the first wife inherit. So you explain to them the logical system that is there. And you point out to them. Think about it. In America, and it does happen from time to time that there are people who are polygamous. You know, a man, he will live near the border of a state. He has a wife in one state and a wife in the other state. He's a traveling salesman, so he has excuse for being away. So he has a wife and he maintains the whole family. Not until he dies and the word gets to the other family and they meet each other. Oh, all these years, this man had been married to two women, raising a family here and there. So think about that. That man is now called a bigamist, a criminal. If he were caught alive, he could be jailed. But, if they were girlfriends, mistresses, no problem. No problem. He can have as many mistresses, girlfriends as he wants, as many illegitimate children as he wishes, no problem. In fact, they will praise him, write stories about him. He's virile. He's a man. But what is the logic here? The man who wants to do it right, looking after people's rights and the children and everything else, you call him a criminal, you put him in jail, and the one who is exploiting women and abusing them and the children, you... It's illogical. It is illogical. Christianity is not monogamous. They say, yes, it was. No, it isn't. You just go back in their history, go
go back into the Bible and there's clear evidence of polygamy some women will ask after that okay we can understand that makes sense many times I've heard this they'll say yes it's quite reasonable and logical though I don't want it for myself but I can understand you know uh, polygamy in this context but what about women why can't the woman have four husbands like the men have four wives that's what concerns me fairness here fairness why not well we explain to them that listen if a man has four wives and he has children the children know who their father is if a woman has four husbands and she gets pregnant and has a child and the child asks who is my father she says one of these four guys <laughs> you think that's a satisfying answer would you be happy to be told that your father is one of these four no. human nature rejects that you want to know who your father is they say okay we have DNA testing okay DNA testing is not 100% not only that how many people have access to DNA testing a fraction of humankind Islam is a practical religion. It deals with the norms of society. Anyway, we see in general that human societies have a majority of females. Wherever you go in the world, women are surplus. Polygamy is one of the ways by which they may be integrated within the family structure because every woman, it is natural for her to want to be a part of a family, to want to be a mother, to want to be a wife. So this is the means for integrating them into the society. Now, if a woman takes four husbands, is that solving the problem or increasing the problem she's now taking four men out of circulation so there's more women the ratio of women to men has increased more women and with the spread of homosexuality today in the world the number of available men have dropped even more so women having four husbands doesn't solve the problem not only that but all the studies that have been done on females and the nature of females it's the nature of a woman to be with one man that's her nature it's the nature of man to be with more than one woman I know you don't want to hear that I know you don't really want to hear that no not my husband because every woman likes to think not my husband you don't know what he talks about when he sits with the guys when he's with you yeah yeah one wife no no I'm never thinking of when he's with the guys oh boy I wish I could have a second wife you know <laughs> that's the reality that's the reality you don't find women sitting together and saying I wish I could have a couple of husbands you know three or four it just doesn't happen it's not their nature so there are logical biological sociological demographic reasons for polygamy Allah has made it a part of the nature of human society so so you give this is the explanation that you give and then you bring it back to Allah it is Allah who made people that way there is a reason for it. It serves a purpose. There is a logic behind it, etc. So, in this way, you tackle the various 
issues that they raise. And there are no end of them. If you want to help prepare yourself, <coughs> uh, there is online a university which I set up back in 2007. It's called the Islamic Online University. And there we have free courses, absolutely free, costs you nothing. Diploma courses, absolutely free. The course there is called the DTC course, that is Dawa training course. Go and take that. There is a course there called Contemporary Issues, where I deal with all of the major questions that are usually asked. It's free. Go and get yourself prepared from that perspective while preparing yourself with the Dean. And there are courses there which deal with the various aspects of the Dean from Aqidah to Fiqh to Hadith to Tafsir. Even Arabic is there. It's free. And there's also a BA course there which we started uh, last year which is tuition free. There's no tuition costs. It's virtually free. BA, which it has uh, a um, accredited degree given from a university in the Philippines. We are linked to a university in the Philippines, in southern Philippines, in Mindanao, and they issue will issue the degrees for us. That degree is recognized by the Ministry of Education in the Philippines. So there is available this degree in Islamic studies, a very comprehensive degree, go to the website www.islamiconlineuniversity.com and take advantage of the knowledge. We're going to stop here now and uh, give you an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, of course, the questions uh, are in the written form. I hope you brought papers and really I guess papers should have been distributed amongst you. They were distributed? Okay, that's good. So those of you who had questions, you've sent your questions in. Now we will go on to the questions that you have. Okay. Okay, we have about 50 questions. Yeah, you want to uh, pass this to him, please? The questions are being sifted to stay on the topic because though we're here talking about dawa, you know, we're going to have people asking questions about a variety of different topics. People like to talk about something and everything. Okay, sister's question, what level of knowledge do we need to have to actively engage in da'wah? We said, an ayah. In other words, you teach what you know. Don't try to teach what you don't know. Right? You stick to what you know. You give what you have. If they ask you a question, don't try to give an answer, because you know some people, they're argumentative. So you get into argument with somebody, they ask you a question, you don't have the answer, but you tell them something which will just shut them up. It's not true. Later on, they're going to find out that what you said wasn't true. Maybe at that time you won the argument, but later on they find out, and how are they going to look at you? Better for you to say, sorry, I don't have an answer to that one. I will go and get the answer and bring it back for you as soon as I can. So you give what you have. What do you need to know? Well, you need to know the basics of Islam. You need to know the five pillars of Islam, six pillars of Iman. That's basic knowledge. Understand it. Understand 
what is behind it what are the goals of salah not the ritual of course you need to know the ritual to do it properly but you should be familiar with the goals why did Allah prescribe salah why did he prescribe fasting why did he prescribe because that's what they're gonna ask you why fast why deprive myself of food so that's what you need to be able to explain and of course you yourself should know why you fast because otherwise what are you doing you're just doing it because everybody else does it and that's why unfortunately for most Muslims today Ramadan is a month of feasting not fasting it's the same F word, but it's feasting, not fasting. That is the problem. We don't really know what Ramadan is about. So, next question. Should our da'wah be restricted to non-Muslims? Or should we also be giving da'wah to Muslims? When Mus'ab ibn Umair was sent by the Prophet ﷺ to Medina to give da'wah in Medina along with the handful that had accepted Islam did he only go out to the non-Muslims of Medina and give da'wah to them? No! He also educated the Muslims. So yes, part of the da'wah involves educating Muslims. Where they are ignorant, because our situation, as Allah said, will not change until we change ourselves. The problem of the Muslim world today is one of ignorance. This is one of ignorance. That's why Muslims are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Non-Muslims come and they ask, why do you people, you know, why does your religion teach you to kill your relatives for the sake of your honor? The honor of the family, known as honor killing. Why? It's not good. You suspect your sister of talking to a guy and what do you do you go catch her and you kill her you and your uncle your father it happens regularly in Jordan in Turkey in Pakistan why where did they get this from this is from the ignorance of Muslims because we don't have any principle of honor killing in Islam. Al qatl is sharaf. We don't have that. We don't. It's not, there's no place for it. Murder is murder. You kill your sister, you are to be killed. But our governments have recognize this custom from the period of Jahiliyyah still amongst us and they go light you kill your sister okay one year don't do it again yeah. this is our ignorance or they ask us female genital mutilation FGM why are you people into this cutting up the private parts of your women Sudan Egypt Somalia why of course they don't realize that the Christians of Egypt do it too it's a custom which predates Islam it has nothing to do with Islam yes Prophet Muhammad did tell the woman who was circumcising in Medina to take only a little bit. Something equivalent to circumcision in a man. 
when a man is circumcised, it's just the foreskin that's removed. You're not cutting off his private parts. Right? <laughs> but for women, it's been justified. We want to make sure she is a virgin when we marry her. This is nonsense. This is evil. It's corruption. How many women die from this process in different parts of the Muslim world today? So oftentimes when we explain to people, you know, this is custom, that is custom, this is Islam, they ask you, hey, how do we know what's Islam and what is custom? Maybe you're just sort of justifying whenever you find yourself backed in a corner, you say custom. When it's good, you say Islam. How do we know? You say, well, you can follow a general rule of thumb. If it's something that Muslims do everywhere, Every part of the Muslim world, they do the same thing. You can be 99% sure that is Islam. But the thing which Muslims do in some places, they don't do it in other places, here and there, it's, then you can be 80% sure that it is not Islam. It's custom. Okay, the feminist issue. Islam is so easy for the guys, for the men, so difficult for the women. There are two elements here, actually. On one hand, there is a general misunderstanding. Because if we weigh the issues, the woman has to cover up herself. The man, according to what they see, doesn't have to cover up himself. It's quite common to see here in Malaysia, people coming from the Gulf, you'll see the guy walking in short shorts with dark glasses, you know, his hair this way, and tight t-shirt, and he's and on his hand, he's got a woman covered up. Boom. You can't even see her eyes. She's walking, you know. And there he is walking. So it's not surprising for them to say, hey, what's happening here? You know, where's the fairness? Right? That is a part of ignorance. Because there are dress requirements for men also. But Muslim men today don't follow them. That is the reality. Most Muslim men today don't follow Islamic dress requirements. How do I say that? Why am I saying that? Well, most men today, we know the aura is between the navel and the knee. Not the navel, not the knee, but what is between the navel and the knee. Now, men wear pants. And I'm not talking about Turkish pants, where the crotch is down by your ankles, or shalwar of the Pakistanis. Waist is like this big, you put it together, huge. We're talking about Western pants. Western pants. Where the philosophy of fashion in the West is, if you have it, flaunt it. What does that mean? If you look good, let everybody know you look good. That is the philosophy of Western fashion. Meaning that the goal in making pants is to expose the aura. That is the number one goal. When they make pants, the number one goal is 
to expose the aura. So it is cut in certain way and stitched in certain way that your behind is hugged by the pant. Your thighs are hugged by the pants. Your aura, if you bend over, if you come into the masjid late, people are in sujood. A'udhu Billah. You can't look ahead of yourself. Otherwise, you'll be looking at men's private parts. A'udhu Billah. And we know one of the conditions for the acceptability of salah is what? Satrul Aura. But we're coming and praying in these pants. Now, in general, in the Muslim world, if a man, he's a practicing Muslim, if his wife wants to wear a spandex outfit, you know, like those people who are skaters, racing skaters, they have an outfit which is like somebody sprayed on them color, right? Now, if your wife wants to come out wearing that, she's got a hijab on her head and like this, you're going to say, hey, come on. Stop for law. Get in there and put on some clothes. Loose. Covering the aura. But what about you? What about you? We have a double standard. It's okay for men to expose their aura, but not for women. So that goes back to ignorance in the ummah. When you look at the early generations where uh, colon colonization started in the M Muslim world, pants were being introduced, you find that Muslims, whenever they wore shirts, it would be long shirts. Okay, they wore pants, but the shirt would come down to their knee. Or here, like in Malaysia, they wear pants, they have a... Uh, what do you call it here? Sarong, sarong. You have a sarong, you wrap around you. Why? Why are they wrapping sarong? Covering the aura. But now after the prayer is over, you take off the sarong and... Hey, something wrong here. You know, Allah is only in the masjid. So there's a problem. It's ignorance. This is ignorance in the Muslim world, which gives this impression to non-Muslims when they look from the outside in. But now, even from the inside out, some women might think, listening to that kind of talk, that, yeah, men have it easy. Do they? At least one week per month, women don't have to pray. We still have to get out there into the masjid. No time off. Allah gave them time off. The four weeks of fasting, we have four. They have three. Hey, where is the difficulty and the ease? In fact, when you look at it, there's more weight put on the man than the woman. Who is responsible for looking after the other? Is it women responsible for looking after men? Or is it men responsible for looking after women? Women are not required to look after themselves. So, it is a gross misunderstanding to think that men have it easy and women have it difficult. When you actually go through and look at the various ahkam, the rules and the principles, men are burdened with more responsibility. They are the head of the family. They will be asked first before anybody else. Question, why give da'wah? In a multicultural society, 
where people have different religions and traditions, why don't we follow the principle of live and let live? Live and let live. لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينُ You have your religion, I have mine. You do your thing, I do mine. Why? Well, why fundamentally because Islam commands us to give da'wah. Because Allah said, give da'wah. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا اُدْعُوا لَا سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِنَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ Commands in the Quran, description of the best given to those who give da'wah. That was the role of the prophets. What was Muhammad sallallahu But a da'i. From the time he received the message to the time he died, he was giving da'wah. That's why we give da'wah. You have the truth. If you really believe it is the truth, then you should feel a burning desire to want to share it with others who have not received that truth. If you are sincere, if you are sincere about your Islam, you must feel a burning desire to want to share it with others who did not hear the message. So that's why. The Christian groups have organized da'wah, sending out missionaries to different parts of the world. Many parts are Muslim, wor Muslim world, the word Muslim world, and then um, they are converting people left and right. What do Muslims have? Do we have an equivalent world council of mosques? where we send out missionaries, we don't have. Mostly it is a few institutions sending out, and mostly it is, after that, individuals who have some knowledge spreading the word. Is that the way it should be? No, it shouldn't be like that. Actually, we should be the most active in spreading the message. We should have the biggest organizations in spreading the word. We have the truth. They have falsehood and they are working night and day, learning the languages of tribes and clans in different parts of the world just to go live amongst them to carry what they consider to be the word of God to these people. Dedication. For us, it's like, mashallah, malish. You know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We have Jamaat Tabligh, the biggest da'wah organization in the world. Jamaat Tabligh with the largest number of followers. When they have their yearly ijtima in Bangladesh, four million followers gather. And at the end of the ijtima, they make a group dua, which people, you know, you just don't want to miss that group dua, for guidance for the world. But when you talk to the people from Jamaat al-Tabliq, their philosophy is you must clean up your house before you invite people in. I mean, there are other issues. I'm just talking about this perspective. You must clean up your own house before you invite people into it. So they say, we shouldn't be going out and giving da'wah to non-Muslims. We should focus on Muslims, make them proper Muslims, and then we can invite them in. So, the non-Muslims, in spite of their huge numbers, very little da'wah being given to them, to non-Muslims. 
So they play a role in terms of inviting Muslims back to the masjid, etc. MashaAllah. You know, we have to recognize there's goodness in it there from that perspective. But da'wah, no. So we can't say there are people doing it in an organized fashion around the world. So, this is part of the challenges. And it is actually a reflection of the state of the ummah. We are fragmented into different countries with our own individual anthems and flags and national nationalism and this is of course a state which the Prophet ﷺ cursed when he said man da'a al-asabiyya falaysa minna people who call to exclusivism whether it is a group or a clan or a region a city or a country etc this is not from Islam. Islam is about humanity, the Ummah, the whole Ummah. That's what Hajj is about. That's the message of Hajj. Islam is the world. Uh, brother has atheists working with him in his work area they're happy with their atheism they're making lots of money they're quite rich what do I say to them well first and foremost you need to know that they're not really happy there is a show there is a facade that they present of happiness. But it's known. Money will not make you happy. And they, though they say I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. You can either tackle that claim, you don't believe in God, Okay, you and so-and-so graduated from the same class. Same marks. You have a nice job making loads of money and he has got a low job making very little money. He's in debt, he's borrowing from his neighbors. and Why? He says, some people might say, my hard work, well, we know that doesn't really work. The people who are working the hardest are making the least. The farmers around the world in the fields who wake up at the break of dawn, they're out plowing the fields all day long. They get home, they just eat, go to sleep. Next day they're back. Bill Gates and the others, they're sitting in an office signing papers you know he's making his billions mental work the hard work is done by the poorest people of the world so you didn't get it because of your hard work so what what is it he says my good luck his bad luck hmm and why did you end up in school, in this school you got in, and your neighbor didn't get into school? My good luck, his bad luck. And you go through his whole life, and you ask, why this, why that? My good luck, his bad luck. My bad luck, his good luck. I think you have a God here. You're saying that the events of your life all of the crucial events of your life is controlled by good luck and bad luck. The more academic term is good fortune 
and bad fortune. Fortune comes from Fortuna, which was the name of the goddess of good luck and bad luck, who was worshipped in Greece. Fortuna. That's your God. You do have a God. Because you have to explain life, why you're here, how you got here, why this is happening. And so it's simple for you because you're giving the reason your God is a blind force. So you don't feel obligated to do anything for the God. You may have artifacts connected to your worship, like what? When you first graduated and you went out in the field, you're looking for a job here, they couldn't get a job, days, weeks, months. Finally you went out, you got the job. Beautiful job. What do you do when you come home? You take off your tie and you hang it in a special place. Your jacket, your pants, special place. This is my good luck tie and my good luck jacket. So anytime I'm going out, I have to do something and I need that extra boost of good luck, I make sure I wear that tie. This is part of your religious artifacts. Or you may have charms, good luck charms. In America, they have the rabbit's foot. They cut off rabbit's feet and they put them on a chain and they carry them. Keychains. Why? Why rabbits? Well, because they noted in earlier times that rabbits were prolific. You put two rabbits together today, by the end of the month you got 50 rabbits. You know, they just produce. That's rabbits. So they say, boy, powerful stuff. Good to have a rabbit's foot. So, they have their rituals. They have, but they don't call it religion. Number 13, popular one. They avoid 13 like the plague. You can't find a 13th floor in any hotel in America. No, none. It doesn't exist. Elevator goes 11, 12, 14. Hmm. What happened to 13? It got named 14. Go down the street. Houses numbered 11, 12, 12 and a half. You don't want to hit 13. <laughs> you become 12 and a half. And this is deep rooted in the society. Ingrained fear of 13. So, you have a God. And, of course, if you want to discuss with them on a logical perspective, then it's good to watch the debates between Hamza Sorsis and leading atheists around the world. On Facebook, you put in the name Hamza Sorsis. T-S-O-R-T Z-E-S, Hamza Sortsis, Hamza, H-A-M-Z-A-H, right? He was a Greek Brit who was an atheist who converted to Islam. And now he specializes in debating the atheists. So he has their arguments down. You want to hear how to deal with an atheist? Then you can learn from him. However, in general, if you're giving da'wah to the atheists, the good position to come from is that it is logical to believe in God and illogical to not believe in God. The best defense is a good offense. Right? You go for the jugular. Because this is what they like to do. They like to say, oh, their belief in God is, you know, illogical doesn't make sense. You can't see him, smell him, and you know, all, have all kinds of things. It's not logical. But in fact, when you look at the issues, belief in God is logical, and it is the disbelief in God which is illogical.
And that's why the mass of humankind believes in God. And only a few don't. In that course, Dawa training course, I give a simple presentation on the logic of belief in God. You can watch that. But if you want to get in deep, Hamza Sortsis is the man. But she doesn't feel that she really believes in Allah. And this is common today. That most people, when they look inside themselves, there are doubts there. Do I really believe in God? Is there really a God? They have those feelings, those thoughts. Of course, it's from shaitan. Satan wants to put doubts in your mind. But the thing is that if you have not prepared yourself, have not understood the deen, then you become an easy prey for Satan. This is why Prophet Muhammad had said, Talabul ilmi farida ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. And where does that knowledge begin with? The first question that you will be asked in your grave is what? Man rabbuk? Who? was your Lord. And that's where we have to start from. We need to know who is Allah. Why, why we should have no doubt in His existence. That is Aqeedah. That's what we call Aqeedah. You must have clarity, certainty in your heart, to stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment. Without that certainty, then it's very easy to be shaken, deviated, etc. So, the solution for God is knowledge. It's ignorance, it's darkness. So the only medicine, the only treatment for that illness is knowledge. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those who know if you don't know. So you have to start with knowledge. But of course, that knowledge is accompanied with ibadah. Because it's not about just going into a classroom and studying academically who God is it's about living the teachings which God has given us so ibadah has to be done along with it but what do you do how do you approach ibadah do you do it the way that you've been doing it no the very reason why you're in the state that you are is because you are doing it as blind rituals and not as something you understood and felt that you needed to do. So that's where we need to be. And that's what we need to pass on to our children, the next generation. They should have an understanding and their minds are huge. They can accept a lot of information. But we generally tend to restrict the information. As a kid, let him play. Don't need to get into those things too complicated later on. No. There is much that they can understand. And we should give it to them when they're young. They grow up with that understanding, that sense of confidence. We, it is our duty to give it. It was our, the duty of our parents. But unfortunately, they weren't given it. And their parents weren't given it. So it was just, you're a Muslim, you fast, you pray, you make Hajj. 
Why? Because you're a Muslim. That's it. Okay, there is a well-known hadith in which a Bedouin came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him about what was required of him. And as the Prophet ﷺ went through the pillars of Islam, one after the other, he would explain the fard requirements. And after explaining that, and the, Be the Bedouin would ask, is there anything else after the obligatory requirements? The Prophet ﷺ said, no, unless you do voluntary acts of worship, fasting, sadaqah, you know. And each time the Bedouin would say, no, I'll stop here. I won't do any less and I won't do any more. I'll just do these things. And when he finished going through and the Prophet ﷺ affirmed that that was it. The, the bare bones, the skeleton, the foundation of Islam. The man turned away, thank you, left. And the Prophet ﷺ turned to the companions and said, he will be in paradise if he's truthful. He will be in paradise if he's truthful. Meaning that if you do the five pillars of Islam as they are required of you, it is ticket to paradise. But the reality is how many of us actually do it the way it is required? That's the point. The ritual, yeah, we do the ritual, but is it the way it is required? Because, <clears throat> for example, we learn the ritual of the Salah, we do the Salah. But Prophet Muhammad said, some people will pray and nothing of their salah is recorded. Nothing. How's that? If the ritual is going to get you to paradise and you're getting zero for every salah, guess what? We're not going to make it. So obviously, the salah is more than just the ritual. It depends on the level of concentration, reflection that is there. If in the prayer we're thinking about what to do when we get home and the game we want to play or place we want to go or thing we want to do and that's what's on our heads. Our body is going through the moments but movements but our heads are somewhere else then there's no reward. There is no reward. Similarly when we fast. How do we fast? The way of the Prophet ﷺ to fast was to have a light meal for Sahur. A light meal. Some olives, khubs, olive oil, and he went into his fast. What do we have? Three course meals. Bring it on. Right? I have to fast today. <laughs> it's a joke. We stuff it in. And then, 
We spend the rest of the day digesting the food. About half an hour before Maghrib, sunset, digestion finishes, and it's now time to eat again. The adhan goes back to the table. We didn't even feel a single pang of hunger. I know Muslims tell non-Muslims oftentimes, fasting is not so hard. I gain weight in Ramadan. <laughs> They're proud. Yeah. At least an extra three, four, five kilos after Ramadan. And non-Muslims look at how? How do you do that? How do you fast for 30 days and gain five kilos? <laughs> Because, as I said, we're not fasting, we're feasting. So, all of the pillars of Islam, if we want to increase our Iman, they have to be done according to the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not just externally, but internally. The last That story you can find on YouTube. <laughs> Click on My Way to Islam, Bilal Phillips, it's there. I gave the whole talk in Australia, it's recorded up on YouTube. But briefly, I can just say that I went from Christianity as a nominal Christian. Nominal meaning, like Muslims, who are nominal Muslims, they're Muslim in name. I was a Christian in name, who went to church. But I wasn't involved in what was going on there. You know, the minister would be up there talking. I'd be there with my friends chatting. You know. <laughs> Later on, as you got older, we'd go to uh, Bible class or whatever. We went to Bible class to meet the girls. <laughs> you know? So that was a nominal Christian. You know? When I went to university and my understanding of the world and what was going on around me was opened up and I realized that there was this oppression and injustice and all these things going on around the world. I wanted to be a part of some movement for change. And at the time when I was in the university, professors, uh, Jewish professors there, were promoting communism amongst the youth. So I heard enough of it and became a communist. And I read, studied, and gave da'wah to communism. That went on for a few years, but the more I read, the more I became disillusioned. The more I moved with the communist party members, the more I realized that these people have no morals. We wanted to remove the existing president, but if any one of these guys got there, he would be worse. And communism couldn't, uh, couldn't compete with capitalism economically. Communism fundamentally an economic theory couldn't compete with capitalism. In the beginning it was a while, but then they got left in the dust. They couldn't compete. So I felt there was a vacuum there. This really wasn't the answer. And at a time when I was in that doubtful state, one of the members 
of the central committee of the group that I belong to, the Communist Party group, she accepted Islam. And I was shocked because I was a basic Marxist-Leninist, Russian type. She was a Maoist, hardcore, memorized Mao's red book. So I was shocked. She accepted Islam. I said, Whoa, how did you, why? What happened? You know, communism teaches you that religion is the opium of the masses. It intoxicates them so that the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, can exploit them. So how? She said, it's different. I said, what do you mean it's different? Islam is different. I had been to the States before and visited one of the centers of the nation of Islam. I visited it. And I was impressed by the way they organized themselves. But when I listened to their theology, what is their theology? White people are devils, black people are gods. Hey, it's nonsense. It's total nonsense. I could never be a part of that. So I said, you know, how is that? I mean, these people are talking nonsense. He said, no, no, no. They're not Muslims. They call themselves Muslims, nation of Islam. Later on, I call them the nation of Mislam. Right? She said, no, real Islam is something else. It has nothing to do with color and these kind of things. So I said, okay, give me some books, let me read. And I began to read. And the book by Muhammad Qutb called Islam, the Misunderstood Religion. When I read that, and I read a book by Maududi Towards Understanding Islam just before that, it was good. But when I read Islam, the Misunderstood Religion, that was it. That was it. Because that book was written from a political perspective. Comparing between communism, capitalism, socialism, Christianity, uh, Islam. From social, economic, spiritual, from all the different perspectives. And systematically he just showed Islam was the answer. So after I finished reading that book, that was it for me, I was convinced. But... That wasn't enough for me now to become a believer in God because I'd been denying God's existence for years. I was an atheist. I didn't believe in God. So you don't just flip overnight. You know, it's not like a light switch. You turn it on, it's on. You turn it off, it's off. So it took a while for me to bring God back into my life to realize God as a reality in my life. Once that happened, which was some months later, I accepted Islam. And after becoming a Muslim, the group of people that I was around, some new Muslims, and the brother who gave me Shahada, he was here in the Emirates, uh, sorry, in um, Malaysia, uh, not too long ago, Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick. I don't know if some of you have attended some of his lectures, he's been here. He is the person who gave me Shahada. Anyway, the point is that uh, at that time, the most active group of Muslims that I saw was Jamaat Tabliq. Right? We had the leading representative for the Jamaat in North America there was with us. He was nicknamed Colonel Saab. He used to be a colonel in the Indian military. His mom was a British woman, father was an Indian. 
big, tall, imposing individual, turban, very you know, active, dynamic. So we went out with him. Three days. Then I ended up on the four months, went to the UK. Uh, based on the fact that I was told, because I wanted to gain knowledge of Islam, and we didn't have any books at the time, Sahih Bukhari, only volume one was translated into English. One, two, something like this. So it was incomplete. Very little literature. In fact, most of the literature available was Ahmadi. They had translated a lot of material, and that was mostly available in English. So, I was told that in England, they had many mosques, and in every mosque, there was a scholar, a maulana, who I could study under. So I said, let me go get that knowledge. So I went out, the jamaat traveled, they had an ijtima there in Dewsbury. And afterwards, I stayed on to complete the four months, going from masjid to masjid. I would sit down with the maulana, with my notebooks, and I would ask questions and write down the answers. After doing that, um, I was told that on one hand, <clears throat> I should focus on what I had been taught. I should read only the book, Fazail Amal. That's the only book I needed to read. And I was told that very plainly when I had gone to a bookstore, bought a stack of books, I came walking back in the masjid with a stack of books, and the Jamaat brothers said, oh, Brother, what, what you got there? He said, I got a book, a stack of Islamic books. Said, where did you get it from? From such and such a bookstore. I said, uh, uh. I said, well, what's wrong here? These books, you don't know the intention of the one who wrote them. So, leave that. For Zayl Amal, we know the intention of the author. Solid book, you keep reading that. I'd already read it like four times. They said, yeah, read it some more. Of course, my background, you know, of reading and wanting to gain knowledge, it left me suspicious. I didn't really like that. It was like a nasty taste in my mouth. And also, I found that they like to tell stories. Fantastic stories. You know when this guy went out on the Jamaat? That happened. Wow. This happened. Oh boy. I told him, listen, you know, I want to go and learn some Arabic. He said, no, you don't need to, you don't need to go. I want to go to Mecca or Medina. He said, no, you don't need to go to Mecca and Medina. The light of Islam has left Mecca and Medina and it is in Nizamabad in North India where Hazrat G, the head of the Jamaat, lives. And that light is so powerful that when Hindus walk the street and they pass by his house, <laughs> they're hit. They come walking in Shahada. Ashadu Allah, ilaha illallah. I'm hearing these stories, I say, oh boy, that's a tough one. So, they told me that um, whilst we're in Ijtima, that they were having a spiritual bath. Would you come join the spiritual bath? And that's how I heard it anyway. Actually, what they were saying in Arabic was bay'ah. In Urdu, it became bayat. And sound for us, the closest thing in English sounds like bath. So we, so we, the Westerners, we said spiritual bath. So we went into this room. Hazrat G was in the other room. And they had the uh, towels tied in a string, right? And we just held on to the towel. 
And we heard him saying something in the other room. And then they came and said, okay, it's, it's over now. We let go. Spiritual bath is over. MashaAllah, we left. So, later, I asked the secretary of Hazraji, I asked him, well, what was that spiritual bath all about? You know, what does it mean? He said, it means that when you go back to Canada and you have to make any decision in your life, you write a letter to Hazraji, I will translate it into Urdu, he will read it, and then he will dictate back to me an answer and will send it back to you, and then you can make your decision. I said, oh, that doesn't sound right. I have an important decision to make in my life. I wait one week to ten days for the letter to reach there. Eventually gets translated after another week. Eventually gets read by Azra G after another week. Eventually gets sent back, tra retranslated and sent back. Three months have gone by for me to make that major decision in my life. I had a problem with that. Then, in the course of my traveling with the Jamaat, and I became like the protege of uh, Colonel Saab, I used to sleep near him. And he taught me Tajweed, alhamdulillah. My first lessons in Tajweed was from him. He taught me Tajweed of the Quran. He was a Qadi. Alhamdulillah, I benefited. Eventually he told me, listen, you know, as a Muslim, you must follow a madhab. There are four. They're all correct, but you must choose one. If you don't choose one, then your imam is shaitan. You got to choose an imam. One. And... Imam -i Azam, Abu Hanifa, he is the best one. <laughs> he was the first, closest to the Sahaba. He had the largest number of followers in the Muslim world. Most Muslims are Hanafis, the greater proportion of them. They are the largest. So I said, it makes sense, okay, if he was closest to the Prophet ﷺ's time, most Muslims are Hanafis, you know, then. I'm a Hanafi, okay. So what does it mean to be a Hanafi? Well, we do things this way. And he taught me Hanafi Salah. For the men, nothing. It's basically the same thing. You just don't raise your hands after going into Rukur. But for women, the Salah is acrobatics. The female Salah of the Hanafis today is acrobatics. You have to be an acrobat. If you haven't been trained in acrobatics, you'll fall down on the floor. <laughs> Trip over yourself. Because there is a special way that they go down to the floor. You don't go down reaching down knees. And, no, 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 no. For a woman to go down like the men, go down knees first, for example. He, the man, he goes down knees first. I said, no, a woman, you know, she must be covering. You know, you don't. Like, no. So how does the woman go down? She has to crumble down. She just sort of crumbles. Right? <laughs> and then she puts her chest on her thighs and her elbows on the ground and she's just huddled up. Ooh. First time I tried it, oh, I fell down. I couldn't do it. I had to practice till I was able to crumble down. Because I had to go back and tell my wife now. You know? When I came back, I said, we are Hanafis. She said, what's that? I said, don't worry about the details, but we are Hanafis. And you have to pray like this. <laughs> so, after I got back, we moved house and I moved next to the masjid. And the brother whose house we rented an apartment in, he had a basement apartment, we rented it. He was from Egypt. His father 
was a scholar among the Ikhwan and he had been raised in scholarship. So he started to teach me from Fiqh Sunnah. Teach me Fiqh Sunnah along with Shafi'i Fiqh books. So I started to notice differences. Hmm. Of course he was bringing evidences. He said, Prophet ﷺ did it, here is the proof. When I was with the Hanafis, there was no evidence. It's just, this is how you do it. Don't do this, you do that, you do this, don't do that. And, and actually when I was studying with them, I remember one occasion, because I was getting my information initially from Colonel Saab, and I found at one point in time, that what he had told me when I sat with the Maulana, some of them were saying something different. So I came back and I questioned Colonel Saab. He, Maulana so and so said that. He said, ah, this is a young guy, young Maulana. He just got out of Maulana school. He doesn't know how to wipe his behind in the winter or in the summer. I said, oh, there's a way to wipe your behind in the winter and the summer? He said, yes. It's not the same. When you wipe your behind in the winter, you're supposed to do it counterclockwise. And when you wipe it in the summer, you do it clockwise. Now, some of you might think this is a joke and it's not really like that, you know. But hey, when I went to Singapore some years back, I went to Singapore and they had a book which was for new Muslims. And I opened up the book and I was reading it. I found it right in there. They had it written up in there. It was a book which had been translated from Urdu, you know, by uh, Molvi, translated into English. And it had in there the description of how to wipe your behind in winter and summer. I told the people at Al Arkham, listen, you better get rid of this book. Anyway, the point is that this the brother who started to teach me Shafi Madhab, I started to see differences and I, questions were in my mind. Uh, Maulana Saab had said, uh, Colonel Saab had said that they're all right. So there was problems coming up here. I befriended some Moroccans hung out with them and the Moroccans that I hung out with, you know, though they were kind of nominal Muslims still, because they used to tell me, they said, you know, back home in Morocco, we break our fast with hashish. So you can understand what kind of nominal Muslims we're talking about. Anyway, but they had learned the ritual. They learned the Maliki ritual. So they said, uh, really when you pray, you should pray with your hands by your sides. You know, Imam of Medina, Imam Malik. That's how he prayed. Did this, that, you know. These were differences. Said, Ooh, problems. Because you can't do all of these things at the same time. How can they all be right? The Hanafis say if you touch a woman, your wudu is not broken. Shafi'is say if you touch a woman, your wudu is broken. If they're both right, it means that you can be in the state of wudu and out of it at the same time. I said, ooh, this is a problem here. It sounds like Trinity. You know? <laughs> How one plus one plus one can equal one. Hmm? We all know one plus one plus one equals three, but they say no, one plus one plus one equals one. To accept that and to believe it, what do you do? You have to turn your brain off. You cannot think this one out. It's just that's how it is. A divine secret. A divine mystery. Anyway, after reflecting on this, I decided I have to go to the center of Islam, where Islam came from, and learn Islam 
from the roots. Study Arabic and study the foundations of Islam to understand, to put all these things into context. And Alhamdulillah, at that time when I made that decision, scholarships were made available. Nobody wanted it, nobody was interested. Myself and Abdullah Hakim, quick, we took it. People at the time were telling us, no! Oh, Muslims around us who are more modern type Muslims, said, no, don't go there. They read old books with yellow pages and, you know, dust all over it. And hey, what are you going to do when you graduate? What are you going to do with this, you know? No, 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 better you stay here. But no, we were insistent. We wanted to go and get that knowledge. So we set out to Medina. And the rest is studying in Medina, graduating, studying in Riyadh, Masters, teaching, completing PhD, becoming a professor, and here I am before you. Alhamdulillah. That's the short version of the story. <laughs>